All right, thanks for staying with us down. The e-learning market is predicted to reach $375 billion by 2026. And like with most businesses, digital education is prospering and developing at an unprecedented rate as technology develops in Nigeria, opening the door for um, industry innovations and endless growth opportunities. Now, with the increasing demand, uh, for flexible and accessible learning solutions, digital education is set to play an integral role in shaping the future of education across the globe. So today we're asking how can the business of digital education thrive in Nigeria? Now please let's hear what you have to say. Remember you can join the conversation. Send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 0810384663. So after I want to bring our guest in a minute. Um, I mean you've... <laughs> You've explored a bit of digital learning. Yeah. Um, if you were to like propose what would be um, an easy way to make it more receptive and a lot more enjoyable and all of that, what would be like your uh, well, the things to consider? One of the major factors that I believe hinders e-learning or digital education in Nigeria, especially, is stable internet connection. Although now, like with the advent of um, well, private network providers, the Etel, MTN, Glow, whatever, it's a lot easier because if you just pay for your own personal internet service, you can get this. But then like if we were able to create sort of a network that standardizes um, your amount of internet reception or whatever, it would be a lot easier for a lot of people. You don't have to have enough money to buy data before you can access e-learning platforms. A website so mm -hmm. that internet connection i think that's what that's key right yeah that's what i would go that's for key. all right so let me bring in our guest fadel altazi <laughs> founded nextford university in 2018 with a vision to enable greater social and economic mobility through high quality affordable education his vision stemmed from um having um built four startups employing over 500 people across 10 emerging markets. Fadel became an entrepreneur at 18 and has accumulated 20 years experience founding digital marketing and SaaS startups, leading award-winning digital engagement and digital transformation projects. Cumulatively, his startups have raised over $35 million in growth capital and employed um, more than 500 people globally. Under New Group International, he launched the um, and grew the social eyes from two to more than 120 people globally. He has worked with Fortune 500 global consumer brands such as Starbucks and government in the US, Europe, and many regions. Paddle has lived in Cairo, Paris, Washington, DC, Dubai, and London. He holds an MBA, a BBA rather, from the American University in Cairo and management degrees from George Washington and Middlesex University. And he's joined us live in studio. Hi, Pado. Hi, how are you? <laughs> a very impressive resume, I must say. So my son looked at you when, when I said you had a startup at 18. <laughs> Do you want to walk us through that journey, you know, before we now delve into the business of digital education? Sure. What were you thinking at 18? <laughs> It's questionable today in hindsight. Uh, I was in last year of high school. Um, in hindsight, I think I was uh, maybe lacking engagement. I was a bit bored mm -hmm. in high school. The dot-com uh, era was starting, and I lived in Egypt at the time. You know, tourism is a big sector in Egypt. Yeah. And I was thinking to myself, how come there's no website where you can go and check out what to do when you go to Egypt, you know, which hotels to stay at, uh, where to visit? Uh, it must be very difficult for a German guy or an American guy thinking of visiting Egypt, getting haggled on the roads. Uh, so I thought to myself it would make sense to build a website that tourists can use to, to plan their trip before coming to Egypt. Awesome. And that was the business? That was the first business, yes. So how, did you, how much did you earn from that business? Oh, zero. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, well, I got back maybe about half of what we invested in it, but uh, that's it. Yeah. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Yeah. But that was the start of a journey. Yes. Yes. I mean, so we're having a conversation around digital um, education. Again, first of all, I want to say well done on Nextford. Um, I know so many people that have gone through the program. 
And I mean, everybody says this is truly a breath of fresh air because up until next flood, it seemed like most people that wanted to go abroad, I mean, that wanted to have a, a second degree would have to either thra uh, travel abroad or they are stuck with, you know, some kind of unverified university certifications that they would do online, you know, and all of that. But I mean, this university came into Nigeria and it just showed that they were ready, you know, to be here. Yeah. The presence, you know, they came with food. I mean, I, I know since we started this partnership with Nextford, I've had like five people call me. Yeah. So do, do they offer, um, a, a, what's it called, <laughs> uh, uh, a PhD in business? Do they offer, this? I say, please, just go on their website. I'm sure you'll be able to find a few things. And a lot of people have said, oh, I have, you know, I've seen so many ads, but I was not sure. I mean, but when I saw them on your set, I said, okay, yes, you know, I think he's doing a credit. I mean, the brand was really really aggressive and a lot of people actually bought into that vision right i mean why did you choose digital education first of all you know and and what what truly you know was the the end goal for 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 for, for you starting up um what's it called next yeah um so why i chose education in the first place is a desire to build a business that delivers uh, social impact so you know, being an entrepreneur for a number of years, I just found myself a lot more interested in building companies that actually deliver positive impact in addition to financial reward. Mm -hmm. um, so when my co-founder and I were thinking about uh, education a few years ago, it was stemmed on this belief that lack of education is the root cause of most, if not all, world challenges. So we thought to ourselves, how can we start to address some of the challenges that exist in the sector? Uh, of course, our initial thinking wasn't to build a university, to be clear, right? When people are thinking about building a startup, you don't really think of building a startup university. It's a concept that sort of doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. like, is it a startup or is it a university? Yeah. The two together is a bit unusual. Um, but one thing led to another. We kept on researching and analyzing the industry more and more. And it became clear to us that disruption has to come from within in the sense that it's not enough to build technology and try to sell that technology to universities in order for them to address their core challenges. Yeah. We would actually have to go direct to consumer and deliver an entire experience from A to Z. Because traditional universities are just, I hate to say it, but most of them are extremely bureaucratic and such, uh, you know, deep rooted, uh, with such deep rooted history and policies and yeah. resistance, administrative resistance. Yeah. So to get them to change is extremely difficult. So it would have been easier for us to sell them technology to address the problems they have. But unfortunately, that became clear to us that route would be very, very difficult. So ultimately, the, the desire was positive impact. Uh, and that stems from, like I said, the personal belief that lack of education is the root cause of most world challenges. Uh, and personally, I think one's duty in life is to leave the world a slightly better place than you found it, in whatever capacity. So that's what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, for you said something about administrative policies being hindrances to students that plan to get a higher education of whatever form for themselves. I think I'm actually a personal, let's say, victim to this because when I was applying to universities, was it last year or early this year, it was so rough because I know that academically, extracurricularly, I'm capable of getting into the best universities in the world if I actually put my mind towards it. But then because of their own priorities that have sort of shifted from the fundamental thing, which is to provide education, to other things like giving people who have legacies admissions or giving scholarships to people because they come from disadvantaged backgrounds. I don't yeah. know, it's like their priorities have shifted so like when I see an organization like Nextword, I am, I am actually pushed to believe in the concept of ed education again because it's like all hope isn't lost <laughs> with <laughs> the world and all that. I appreciate that. Yeah. Mm. I think hope isn't lost uh, for sure. But, but you're right, to, to your point, I mean, when we, when we were thinking about how to address the challenge, this was back in 2018, yeah. to your point, we, we surveyed students around the world from India to China to America, Nigeria, Philippines, all over the world. And we asked them one question. So we said, what is the primary reason you go to university? Yeah. And then we took that same question and we asked it to administrators across universities. So we asked them, what is the primary reason you exist as a university? And so the vast majority of students told us is to get a job. Mm. But then the vast majority of administrators told us a very, very different answer. 
as a way to help people in life, you know, to, to shape the future of the world, uh, you know, to fund research. So there are a whole range of reasons that we realize none of which were aligned to actual student interests. Yeah. Mm. So if, we, if you accomplish all these things, still you're not better off as a graduate. Mm. So it showed us what we, what we then dubbed as this disconnect between the buyer and the seller. The buyer is buying a cervix expecting it to deliver something, but the seller actually has no intent to deliver that. Yeah. They intent to deliver something different. They have their own personal agendas. Yeah. Hmm. That's interesting. So, I mean, there's a business in this market, right? Um, first of all, <laughs> I don't know how much of the, the, what's it called? The business model was, you know, because, I mean, with, with, with Nextport, it's quite, it's quite simple. Um, anybody can afford it. As long as you're able to plan, if you have a monthly income, you can just set something aside and just pay for your courses and all of that, right? Was that intentional? You know, was that the, the structure of the business that you wanted, you know, to be able to reach everyone, you know, with um, with Nextfoot? Yeah, hundred percent. It was a, it was a core pillar. Uh, so we have two pillars in, at Nextfoot. Everything we do must adhere to these, these two pillars. You know, one is affordability. And the second is uh, a focus on business and technology related disciplines. So uh, the idea was to deliver impact to the largest number of people possible. We could charge double the tuition and have half the number of people afford Nexford, but the business model is designed from scratch for the maximum affordability to the largest number of that's people rich. in the world. And that's where the, the impact angle comes in. And again, it's one of our fundamental uh, differences or disagreements with some of the traditional uh, providers who I have to say historically have been limited by size of classroom. So, you know, they just had limited capacity, so they had to, to adhere to that. In an online environment, it's a bit different, so the pricing structure can be different as well. Mm. Uh, but yeah, 100%, I mean, we, we, we want to essentially render things like physical location, gender, race, ethnicity, all to be no longer really inhibit one's ability to move forward in life. So these should no longer be barriers for your ability to move forward in your mm. career. And this was not specific to emerging markets. This was like, is, is this the general standard across, you know, anywhere Nextford is able to, you know, yes. to play? Our pricing is globally affordable. Mm. So we are, I would say, um, the first American university designed from scratch for a global audience. So mm. in the US, our pricing will be extremely affordable as well. Uh, but it's designed for a global audience. The pricing changes by market. Yeah. So what a Nigerian will pay is different from what a Chinese will pay or mm -hmm. someone in the US. Uh, but in each market, pricing is localized in order to be locally affordable to that market. Awesome, awesome. All right, so we'll take a very short break now. When we come back from that break, we'll continue the conversation. Stay with us, we'll be right back. All right, thanks for staying with us. Now, if you just tuned in, we're discussing the business of digital education with Fadel Altazi. <laughs> I hope I got the name correctly. Now, uh, please let's hear what you have to say. Remember, you can join the conversation, send us an SMS or WhatsApp to 81 All right, so I mean, this conversation is getting really interesting. So there's a business part of education, right? Um, so and what I hear you say is you literally can, you, you actually have the capacity to take on the entire market because you don't have any limitations like maybe structural limitations and all of that all you just need to do is continue to expand the capacity of the number of students that your platform can accommodate right so what's the plan for for next word so we have no physical restrictions as you indicated but uh, we still need to resource appropriately because we maintain sort of a, a, a ratio between you know, advisors and faculty and the students or the learners who enroll. Uh, that way we ensure that learners get the support that they need and they get it rapidly, right? Yeah. So we want to make sure that the experience that they have is, is an optimal, optimized experience. Yeah. Um, having said that, yeah, we intend to enroll you know, tens of thousands of learners, you know, over the years. So I would say, you know, a much larger scale than any traditional or any physical university in Nigeria or even in other countries. Um, so I would say, you know, over the coming five years, I would say we, we aim to enroll in at least 100,000 learners. Um, so the business is designed for scale. Uh, for us, we achieve that scale through 
a combination of product expansion and geographic expansion. Mm. So as we start attracting you know, larger audiences from a larger number of markets, as well as launching additional programs, uh, being of undergraduate degrees or graduate or shorter programs, like we recently launched yeah. a number of shorter certificates, mm. yeah, ranging from three to six month programs. So um, when you say geography now, how many locations are we looking at that we are currently operating from? Today I would say, uh, I mean, it's not operating from really because we're 100 Yeah, you can, yeah you can do anything, but in terms yeah. of like, you get what I mean, like yeah, a, yeah, community. Yeah, community. I would say today I believe we're at over 90 countries, it might be over wow. 100, wow. so many countries, yeah. Awesome, awesome. Okay, you had a question. Mm. <laughs> this is all quite crazy. The thing that you said at the beginning about you starting this is at 18. It's, it has been ringing in my head since she first said it. And I'm like, so uh, it can't just be boredom. I guess for people that take those kinds of bold decisions, there has to be something literally inside you yeah. that drives that. It means that now, literally next year, I could say I want to become an entrepreneur and I'll begin to do everything that I need to, to get to that stage. So I'd like to ask, what exactly was your frame of mind? Like if you could inspire someone who was in a similar position as you to take that bold step to try to build something for themselves? How would you? Are you 17? I'm 17, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll give you the answer you're probably not expecting. Uh, it might not be so inspirational. Mm. Uh, <laughs> honestly, if I were to look back, I don't think I would redo it the same way. Okay. I think, uh, for me at least, I was really in a rush to start working. Uh, frankly, I didn't need to necessarily, but I was in a rush to be more independent, to be intellectually like stimulated. Start your life in the real world. And all that. Yeah, I just really start applying. Like I remember, I would go to college in a suit. At one point, the security guard would think I was a professor, so they'd call me like doctor. And uh, I remember one of our clients once called our office, and and then they told him, no, he's at university. So then the guy called me the next day. He said, I'm so sorry. I should have been calling you doctor father all this time. I didn't realize you were a professor. I'm like, I was actually in class, but having said that, like I missed out obviously on college life, mm. but maybe to help if, if folks, you know, sort of insist on going down that journey or are determined on going down the journey, I think the part that most founders miss is actually the self-reflection part. Okay. So that would be the part that I would really advise to begin with. Self-reflection in the sense of thinking about the why, like why do I want to start this business? Yeah and really uh, trying to understand what it entails to actually build a business from scratch. Because unfortunately, people spend too much time on Instagram and Twitter and so forth, uh, and therefore they're inspired by the glamorous life that we see on Instagram yeah. of, uh, you know, this company became a billion dollar company, this other company raised 100 million and so yeah. forth. But the reality is 99.9% .9 of other companies are failing, right? Yeah. Of, of, of startups in general. So we're not seeing these stories. And I think a large part of why many of them fail is that lack of thoughtful approach from the beginning. The self-reflection part. Exactly. So self-reflection, you think, why do I want to do this? And really making sure that am I prepared to go on this very, very tough journey? It's not a journey that's going to be glamorous, at least not for the first few years. Yeah. Mm. Awesome. So I, I want to take you back to what um, Alpha talked about when we, talk, when we started the conversation on the hindrances, right, when it comes to digital education. Um, it's a huge problem, right? Um, data, um, affordability, then also even the rich, right? Some people can't even, they don't even have access. It's not even now, it's not this question of affordability. There are some places that you go to, it's not even available, right? So, I mean, for someone that is in the business of making sure that people are online and are able to learn online, what are you doing in the regard of um, ensuring that, you know, some of these emerging markets have access, you know, to not just um, data, but at least affordable data that can, you know, ensure that they continue to learn without um, having to stop, you know, yeah. their education. Yeah. So um, a few years ago here in Nigeria, we did a partnership with MTN specifically for this purpose to yeah. subsidize data costs uh, for learners while they're enrolled at Nexford. Um, it's not live right now. But it's something that we're looking to revive with a number of telcos. We did a similar one in other markets like in Indonesia with, uh, with a telecom company called Indosat. So uh, we, we try to work on these partnerships with telecom companies to um, subsidize data costs for learners throughout their enrollment periods. But from a design perspective, more importantly, we try to design the product itself 
in a way that's uh, quote unquote data friendly. Yeah. So, so it doesn't consume. Not heavy. Yes, exactly. So uh, I remember in the beginning, uh, especially in the US when we were building our team, you know, people were talking about virtual reality and mm. augmented reality mm. and all these bells and whistles. Uh, but in reality, these are very data heavy uh, applications. Yeah. So we decided not to go down that route and build a product that's you know, more, uh, more data friendly. But the good news is we don't need to worry about it too much. Uh, because the world's biggest companies are solving this problem. Yeah, mm. they're catching up. Yeah, they're, they're catching up and we're fortunate enough that... To just align. We're <laughs> completely <laughs> aligned. So we can ride the wave and we'll be... Just ride the wave. Yeah, from Google to Apple to uh, Amazon. <laughs> so if people aren't connected, these companies can survive. So mm. thankfully, you know, billions of dollars are being invested in connectivity. And this is only a matter of time that everyone is going to be connected. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Oh, so you're in Nigeria. Right. Um, I hear there's a graduation happening this weekend. You know, you want to tell us a little bit about that. There is. There's a graduation happening tomorrow at uh, Landmark. Um, we hold a graduation here every year. It's predominantly focused on Nigerian graduates who aren't able to travel to the U.S. either for economic reasons or uh, visas are, are are too difficult to get. So we're expecting, I'd say, about a thousand people there. We have basically three events happening tomorrow. We have the graduation ceremony with a number of great speakers, followed by a career fair where we have a number of employers who are actively hiring. We're going to be there meeting our graduates. Uh, and then we have a number of master classes happening as well in the spirit of continuous education. So right after they graduate, they have to come back to master classes. A um, number of industry speakers are going to be there. We actually also have a startup competition happening tomorrow with a number of our founder graduates who are going to be pitching to VCs and getting live feedback uh, at the event. Awesome, awesome. I mean, because I was just going to ask that, you know, outside of the learning, because the traditional learning is you go to school and you're done, right? Um, what was the added advantage? So what is the unique proposition that you know you're offering that will make someone say you know i think i'll go with these people i mean you've just answered it because the biggest one of the biggest challenge that we have i mean i hear that the unemployment rate right yeah. now is is really huge right i mean if you have 70 of our 70 percent of our population our youthful population and a good number of that population they are on some of them are on unemployed some of them are unemployable Right? I mean, so if you are saying, okay, outside of the training that has happened, we're putting to together, you know, yeah, first of all, we've trained you to make you have the capacity to be employable, then we're also putting together, you know, it's a team of people that would come and say, you know what, I am looking and I'm trying to hire. That's a, a complete value chain. You know, that's um, adding value to, you know, the learner. Yeah. Why did you do that? I mean, like you said, it's about adding value. Ultimately, we don't measure our success by enrollment, right, or by growth. Mm -hmm. We measure our success uh, through the success of our graduates. Mm -hmm. So that is by far the number one priority at Nextfit. Uh, we think of a metric called basic as ROI. So we, so we, we target for our graduates to get a three to five X return on their own education investment yeah. within three to five years of graduation. So you're, you're investing in this education to get a better job, to build your business, to get a promotion, to switch jobs. Like millions of jobs are going to disappear over the coming years sure. as a result of technology and AI and so yeah. forth. So uh, we want to be the folks who are preparing people for the skills that they need. And events like tomorrow are an example of how we build community and how we add value to that community. And beyond graduation, it's important that we continue linking people with employers. It's important that we put people in front of you know, coaches and mentors who can continue because, you know, education is lifelong today. Yeah. So it's not about going to college for a year or two or three or four. You know, it's about learning how to learn. So, so we intentionally designed the master classes to happen tomorrow right after graduation as sort of a demonstration of that. You graduated, but that doesn't mean learning is finished, yeah. right? You need to continue uh, learning for the rest of your life. Awesome. You want to come Because I, I just wanted to touch on something. So... Uh, for the startups, right, you put them in front of VCs. So how do you ensure that, you know, that, um, that startup is sustained? You know, is, are there, like, more things that you do with the startups outside of just putting them in front of VCs? Do you have, like, maybe structures that sets up um, a kind of, uh, what's it called, monitoring process for the startup yeah. to continue yeah. to grow? Yeah. We don't right now. Okay. So our role pretty much ends when they graduate and... Uh, 
and when we have events like the one we're to get putting together tomorrow. Um, however, in, in early next year, we, we're going to be launching a dedicated entrepreneurship program specifically, and that's going to have, uh, I would say, an extension beyond graduation uh, along the lines of like an accelerator slash incubator in partnership with a number of VCs. I mean, we don't want to cross the line to pretend to be experts in all industries. No. So we're not well equipped as an organization to incubate a startup but we are well equipped to prepare them with the skills that they need and put them on a path that then connects them with the next supporter throughout their, 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 their startup journey. Awesome, awesome, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I thought you had a question. No, I'm, I don't know. You are just learning, all right. Yeah. So I mean, Fadi, if you had something to say to anyone listening now today, what would you say to that person? I mean, the person is thinking, should I, should I not, you know, and all of that. What would you say to that person? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I would say, unfortunately, Japan is sort of top of mind when I'm here, right? Mm -hmm. You hear of this issue every day, and it's draining the country. Oh, wait, 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 wait. Did you just call Japan as Japan? Yes. <laughs> it's Japan. Japan. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So, um, I would say, you know, an investment in education is the best investment one can make in life. An mm -hmm. um, investment in your own education. So whether it's next Friday or anyone else, that's, that's not the point. Uh, but the point is, you need to forge your own future. And by thinking, should I or should I not, as in, like, should I you know, invest in education, the answer is always yes. The form can differ, and the time can differ, and the program can differ. The second part of that, I would say, is don't invest in education to be what I call a credential hoarder, mm -hmm. where you're just gathering credentials to hang on your wall. Uh, what really matters is, what have you actually learned? Uh, and how you're going to apply that. So that's what I would say. I mean, you must invest. It's not a question that one can ask. You must invest in educating yourself. Uh, but really think about why am I doing this, again, to my earlier point, and how am I going to apply it. Mm. And to someone that is thinking of starting um, something in, in the line of educating people as well, what would you say to that, those people? <laughs> in, uh, ed tech is a very, very challenging industry. If, you, if you're trying to sell to universities, it's a very, very long sales process. Uh, if you're trying to sell direct to consumer, uh, you know, it has its advantages and, and its challenges. Uh, but I would say, like, there's still tons and tons of opportunities to be addressed. Um, I suppose if I had to choose one, I would say, you know, do really good research to make sure that what you're building solves a real problem. Uh, this is a, a challenge I see with a lot of founders. They build a product that they think people want, uh, but doesn't actually solve a problem. So it's sort of a nice to have. And very few people are willing to pay for things that are nice to have in an economic climate like Nigeria. So, you know, make sure that you're solving a real problem that people recognize they have, not that you think they have. Mm. Mm. I was actually, I'm taking this online course right now on, uh, from Coursera. It's Google's UX design, user experience. And then literally what you just said now about you not projecting your own um, imaginations of what you use as experience as challenges to them. You actually have to gather their data. own problems, gather data, yes, to see whether they're actually going through the problems that you think they're going through yeah. before you try to solve them. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so one, should I say one more final question? <laughs> no, I have, one, I have a question. So yesterday we talked about the challenges in Nigeria, right? How, I mean, um, one of our anchors said that education is no longer relevant. Mm. And I'm sure you're going to strongly disagree with that. <laughs> but she said education is no longer relevant, that as far as she's concerned, um, let's fill up the skill gap and find a way to solve the problem. So we have a lot of problems in Nigeria, infrastructural problems, you know, so many problems, right? And I strongly agree with you that education can be one of the biggest drivers to, you know, kind of like solve this problem. Um, so. I mean, if you really look at the landscape of Nigeria, it's quite unique, right? We have a lot of things that are available, but at the same time, we have a lot of challenges that do not make those things accessible, right? Um, so if you were to, um, to look at the challenge we're having, especially in the skill gap, right, how do we tailor? Because the educational structure around skills is a bit tricky, right? We don't have, like... It's not, proper, yeah. it's not standardized. It's not standardized and all of that. And, and that way, when these graduates come out or when these people are in the workforce or in the market, they are not able to earn 
a decent living, you know. So, I mean, we're talking about how someone was imported to come and tile, like put interlocking stones on the right. ground. Yeah. I mean, when they're building in this country, for instance, I mean, we have a lot of infrastructural challenges. Why do we have to import? So there's a huge skill gap, right? And I believe that if we have an educational body that understands this skill gap and is able to close it. So imagine you're coming out as a graduate in plumbing, for instance, right? And you come out as a graduate in plumbing. You, you would immediately, first of all, find something to do immediate earning and at the same time your level of um, entry market entry in terms of earnings and all of that would definitely not be what you know somebody on the roadside is doing yeah. so do you see um what's it called the edutech able to solve this major skill gap in in nigeria i think 100 percent edtech is going to help address this challenge which as you indicated is a huge challenge um and ironically despite unemployment being so high you know, every, every executive of every large organization we work with in Nigeria cites hiring qualified people as one of their top two challenges. Absolutely. So it sounds counterintuitive. But anyone I tell this to outside of Africa says, of course not, there's so much high employment, there's tons of people. But no, there is. They're unemployable. Yes. Mm -hmm. So it's a huge, huge challenge. Uh, honestly, I think the solution is, you know, could take us a very long time to talk yeah. about, but it stems really in two things. I think one is cultural. There needs to be a cultural shift from uh, looking at education as uh, a transactional sort of uh, document that I want to hang on my wall uh, because so long as you're looking at it as just a credential I want to hang on my wall you're not really thinking about the value mm -hmm. of that what am I actually learning from this what you can do with it what am I going to do with it yeah. uh, so therefore that impacts your choice uh, like when you're buying a car you're looking at okay is this car going to take me from point A to point B Absolutely. the car looks amazing but it's not going to take you to point B, you're not going to buy it. Yeah. Because you're buying it to go from point A to point B. Yeah. So I think people you know, need to think about what am I going to learn here and choose based on that. And the second is, uh, unfortunately, regulation. I think regulation is choking this, this, uh, the sector here and in many other countries. Uh, so we need, I think, a massive amount of deregulation and letting uh, market economy sort of create supply and demand. And therefore, you know, the high quality places will survive the poor quality will not survive, right? If you know that yeah, by yeah, going yeah. to institution X, you will fail, why would you go there? Mm -hmm. Automatically but, it becomes a redundant and exactly, it's canceled exactly. out. But yeah. there are artificial factors in the, in, the, in the regulatory system here and in other markets mm -hmm. that point people in specific directions where they need to go to one of you know, maybe yeah. 10 institutions, yeah. even though these institutions have no record of actually positive uh, graduate outcomes. Yeah. Mm. I will let you have a comment. A quite quite okay. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Um, my comment says, <laughs> "Our Gen Z, <laughs> you are partially welcome. When are you all coming back on the show? You wet our appetites for just about a week, then disappear. <laughs> Why now? We really miss you all, Mr. Deniji from Aja. We miss you guys too. <laughs> today was actually today was a very interesting day because I think one of two of the co anchors that are supposed to be here unfortunately couldn't make it. So yes, yeah, so so he bailed me out. I eh? literally just happened to be in the studio. So <laughs> that's the only reason why I'm here. All of my friends they have gone to different places. But then, <laughs> don't worry, we're coming back very soon. We'll definitely come back. But thank you so much, Fal um, Fadil. 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 <laughs> I will learn it. I'll go to Cairo because of you. I'll go and learn the language. <laughs> but thank you so much. I think we had an amazing conversation. And in all honesty, I really, I really, really am rooting that we're able to solve a huge gap, you know, and which is the fact that um, we start to change the numbers of un unemployable young people. Yes, it's one thing for you to shout that there are no jobs or whatever, but people actually have jobs but there are no skilled people to be able to take on those jobs yeah. so it will it will really be nice to you know take the conversation further i have some ideas for education in the media space so we will have the conversation behind the scene <laughs> <laughs> but thank you so much i think we had an okay. amazing conversation alpha thank you so much for taking out time to be with me yeah, thank you so much <laughs> before we go i sure you follow us across all social media handles that we share africa you can interact with us further, drop a comment, or more importantly, follow all our engagements on social media, like, share, and invite your families and friends to watch and follow the conversation. Now, if you missed our quote for today, here it is again. It says, um, where's my quote? Where is my quote? <laughs> it says, we can close the gap 
and improve what happens in the classroom by using educational technology that is the same high quality everywhere. Uh, we'll see you guys at 8 p.m. on Monday as we bring another great conversation to your screen. That's um, Independence Month and Celebration Day. We'll see you guys on Monday. Enjoy.